Earning by Ryan Diller. Act One. Lights up on Carl Ulrichs and Bill Burr, a strapping man mid-conversation. Projection. Hildesheim, Kingdom of Hanover, 1855. And then the young boy said, I see no reason to grow up to be an emperor, to be pope. Now that's the one with the power. And so his father asked, but is this pope one to be admired or reviled? And the boy said, admired, is he not? He is a servant of God. And at that, his father, being the good Lutheran he is, sent the boy to his room not to finish another bite of his supper. We found out later that young Rudolph had been had begun a, a friendship with a Catholic child. Needless to say, he is no longer to spend time with that child. Because the boy is Catholic. Of course. I am not sure if I would dissuade a child from friendship simply because of the boy's religion. You cannot be telling me that you would have your child if you had one. Be friends with a papist. I see no reason to rule out Roman Catholic friends for my children, though they will always be metaphorical. You can never see yourself marrying? No. To go a lifetime without the touch of a grown woman does, does not give you despair? Not in the least. You find that strange? I can perhaps understand. But you are married. And I cannot say her touch has ever given me satisfaction. Does it make you uncomfortable that I say that? Oh, no, no. To speak frankly of sex disturbs some people. I appreciate your confidence in me. You are a tolerant man. There is a difference in me that makes me understand the differences of others. Perhaps my difference is not so different from yours. No? I have sensed it in you. People like us can see that difference in each other, though it so often easily eludes the others, does it not? Yes. Yes, it does. And uh, why is it you intend to never have children, Ulrich? I think you know why. I believe I do. We are in a discreet place, yes? Yes. Then perhaps it is time to forego the coded speak. Very well. They look into each other's eyes. Carl moves to kiss him. With a touch of force, Bilber stops him. I think you have misunderstood. Oh, God. Relax. It was not what you think. My intention was not to... Of course, you must know. It was not to... I, be I believe I do know. Uh, you are not the first, believe it or not. I, I am not the... Calm down, Ulrichs. Though it has been a while. When it had happened before, I, I was still a boy. What happened? He tried to kiss me, much as you did. And so I beat him silly. Oh. You have no need to worry. I, I will not do that to you. We are men of the law now. I was 15 then, and, and the boy was 12. What happened after you beat him? I, I told him that if he told another soul, I would kill him. And not a word has been said of it until now, I imagine. But I, I have grown since then. I think I have some sympathy for people like you now. I am glad not many do. I have little room to judge. How do you mean? I feel looking at a young female as, as you do looking at a young male. Yes, you understand. It is the same desire, only the direction of it is different. I suppose. Uh, but you do understand what I'm saying, yes? Of course. When you see a beautiful woman in the prime of life, you feel as I do seeing a beautiful man in the prime of life. And what age is this prime? Well, that is a matter of debate, but I suppose it must at least be... After puberty. I imagine it would be. I see you have misunderstood me. I do know of a man who said he experienced the touch of one in their 20s while he was 14 and it was beautiful to him, and he speaks of the experience fondly. Perhaps it is not unnatural for you then to prefer young women of 14 who prefer a man of your age. At 14 they are spoiled. You understand that, Ulrich? 
I know you relish the innocent gaze of a boy far better before he has reached puberty. But I must tell you, I do not. No more than you feel that way. Not towards a, a small boy, certainly. I have shocked you. No, no. Uh, one may face these unbidden thoughts and live with them, I imagine. I, you and I live in the same direction. Uh, we, we shall walk together. Uh, tonight I must go another way. You must? I have family I must see. This late? We walk with one another to church in the morning. Ah, religious. Good. You know that people of our nature do not have to be without God. Yes. Would you have your nephew consort with the Mohammedans? Pardon? You cannot have children, of course, but like a nephew, say. You could let them be friends with the Papist, but a, a Mohammedan? Uh, a Muslim child, sure, I should imagine. I... A Jew, then. Uh, they are more common. I should go. Your benevolence does not extend to Jews? Uh, of course, there, there must be limits to tolerance. I, I would let him be friends with a Jewish child. It is late. Perhaps and... I should walk with you. Uh, strange creatures come out at night. I, I can manage. Thank you. Have a good night. I will see you around the court. Let us do something again soon. Good night. Good night. Hey. You are tolerant, Ulrich. That is an honorable thing. Thank you. My family really is expecting me. Of course, family is the thing that matters most. Wish them well for me. I will. Carl exits. Bilber watches him go for a beat. He exits in the other direction. Poplar, unseen. The way I see it is this. He confided in you. Perhaps he should not have. We can hope he may not act in his words. You know, you have some good chances ahead of you. I'm thinking about placing you in the Edelbert's office. Though he probably does not need the extra hands, it would be a good opportunity for you. I do wonder why he told you those things to begin with. Did you do something that might have spurred him to speak as he did? Blackout and scene. In the blackout. Ah! Ow! Ow! Stop! Just relax. That hurts. Stop. <sighs> Taylor shop of Lena's aunt and uncle in Vienna. Lena is having a corset tied onto them by Aunt Clara. Projection. Vienna, Austria, 1868. A tailor shop. Just breathe. Um. Oh, stop being melodramatic. Oh, Lena, you look so beautiful. Oh, stop pouting. You should be grateful. I am dressing you in the highest fashion. What do you say? Huh? Uh. Aunt Clara hits Lena moderately. Ow! No, huh? It is undignified. Stand up straight, for goodness sake. Oh, look how beautiful you are! You will have a husband in no time. What is it? Nothing. Oh, no, it is never nothing. Come on now, what is it? The corset is not right, is it? No, it isn't. It could be emphasizing you more if you let me just adjust right uh, there. No. Aunt Clara, what if I don't want to get married? Excuse me? It, it's nothing. Don't worry. It's... No, no. Hold on, hold on. Let us talk. Woman to woman. Okay, I... I was nervous myself when I began courting. I'm sure, but... Knew the country, right? And being 20, so old. I mean, that's not really- But my parents were so kind to me. They said they would take me to the tailor and fix me up right. And I swear, Lena, your uncle- Oh, gosh. Oh, the way he <sighs> looked at me. I knew I had him. Now, I know what you're thinking. She just grabbed the first man she saw. I'm not- But I always wanted to own a tailor's shop, Lena. And the other men around here, they just not measure up. 
Aunt Clara, I think I'm okay now. Uncle, it's solid, saturated, moldable. What? The point is, dear, I get it. It can be scary, but you will come to love the boy who chooses you. Who chooses me? Well, he must think he did the choosing. You understand? Okay. (laughs) Dear, you are the light to this family. And you will be a light to your husband, too. And your children. Thanks, Aunt Clara. I'm good. All right, now, dear, I have a beautiful dress to show. Do I have to wear this corset? What? I mean, it's beautiful, Aunt Clara. And the problem is? But, um... Yes? Shouldn't someone like me for who I am? (laughs) What? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Leah. Yes. 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 Of, of course. But a man needs a nudge in the right direction. Huh? Sorry. 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 So are you saying I should? Absolutely not. I wasn't going to say. Nothing of that sort. Although when he expresses that interest, That is the crucial moment. Oh, no. When you see him undressing you with his eyes. Aunt Clara, please. Shame him nicely, of course. You are are shocked. You are flattered. Yes, yes, but but shocked. You are not that kind of girl. But of course, if you marry. No more, please. I can be of some help. (laughs) Oh, I envy what awaits you. Now, let us get that dress. Aunt Clara exits, lay, unseen. You are almost a man now. Aunt Clara re-enters. Did you say something? Just that you are a woman now. Oh. End scene. A courtroom in Vienna. On stage are the judge, prosecuting lawyer, defendant's lawyer, and Richard von Kraft Abing, who is on the stand. The defendant is not seen. Projection, a Vietnamese courtroom. State your name for the court, please. Richard Von Kraft Abing. And your profession? Clinical psychiatrist and professor at the University of Vienna, where I am the chair of department, uh, uh, chair of the department of psychiatry and neurology. And your field of research? Sexual pathologies. Would you please state your qualifications? I completed my medical degree at Heidelberg University, where I specialized in the study of sexual pathologies, was director of the Insane Asylum in Graz for nearly a decade, and have been preparing a comprehensive clinical forensic text to be titled Psychopathia Sexualis, which will provide courts with a survey of every sort of sexual pathology, including their possible causes and the legal history of each pathology in Austria and the German states. It'll be the first work of its kind. How far are you into this effort? I have already completed profiling over a hundred legal case studies and legions more studies regarding non-prosecuted patients. Some of these case studies come from my experiences in this courtroom where I have offered expert testimony for 20 years now. But is the witness qualified to comment on this particular case? Are you serious? I'm sorry, I should have waited my turn. By all means, go ahead, unless the prosecution... I would be delighted. Your move. Sorry, what was your name? Richard Von Kraft Abing. Ah, Thank you, Dr. Kraft Abing. You clearly have a great deal of general knowledge about different sexual behaviors, but Do you have experience with the specific type of behavior my client has engaged in? Cases of necrophilia are very familiar to me. Sorry, uh, what what is that? That is all right. That paper did come out only a year and a half ago. Uh, Necrophilia, it is my coinage. Uh, The meaning of the word is in its construction. I, I, I do not follow. All you must do is derive from the roots. Do you need help? Sorry, um, 
philia is, is love, right? Love of. So love of necro. You know necro, of course. I was always poor at Latin. Ancient Greek. It comes from one of the most comic, every classically trained person has had to translate it many times. Dead. Love of the dead. Sexual acts on corpses. So you are familiar with the sort of behavior? Yes. Prosecution. We have come this far. What if the defense were to get his cross-examination out of the way now? Oh, that would be splendid. I I'm quite nervous. No one could tell. So I would like to get it out of the way. Um, you would do that for me? Absolutely. I cannot allow that. I it will speed this up. The defense may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the witness aware that my client is a respected government clerk with over eight months of experience? I am now. And is the witness also aware that my client is an active member of the Karlskirch? The defense is warned to get somewhere with this. Could a man of such religious piety and a representative of our nation's beloved sovereign truly be a depraved, diseased, and dangerous individual? Yes. You did not take the time to consider the question. The answer is yes. Are you sure? How long have you been practicing law? Just under a month. What is your specialty? Property law. How did you get this case? I am passionate about the client's moral character. He is his brother-in-law. Ah. Uh, your time is about up, defense. A moment, please, Christoph. Did you happen to pick up any of the city's newspapers the first Sunday of this month? No, I find the news depressing. Well, if you had glanced upon any of those papers' headlines, you would have seen the story of Zed Locker. Zed Locker was a superintendent at St. Michael's School for Boys. He was widely beloved for his wisdom, warmth, and spiritual example. Among his friends were our bishop and our mayor. Does Zed Locker sound as though he is at least on equal moral standing with your client? The court will record my client as being equal of this Zed Locker. He molested his oldest daughter for three years and was convicted of incest at the start of this month. I provided expert testimony at his trial. Oh. Are you done? Uh, one more question, please. Be quick. So you have experience in necrophilia? The defense rests. Yes, sir. I will be brief, Your Honor. Thank you. Richard, is necrophilia indicative of psychopathy? The act is so heinous that the assumption of psychopathy is under all circumstances justifiable. Why do you say that? A man's natural disposition must be seriously perverted for him not to be repulsed by death. For life is the desirable state and death disdained by biological necessity. To desire sexual relations with a cadaver is to completely forsake that most essential aspect of all species, the drive to procreate. And so the defendant must be considered psychopathic and thus must be placed in an asylum? It would be my recommendation he be placed in an asylum. Because he is psychopathic? Presumably. No, he needs a yes or a no. Is the defendant unquestionably psychopathic? Is that really how you intend to ask it? The answer already, Richard. The answer is no. Pardon? There is no scientific proof of necrophilia being a sign of mental unsoundness. But Richard, you just said the assumption of psychopathy is justified in all cases of necrophilia, yes? The assumption is justified, yes. Anyone with even a trace of knowledge regarding aberrations of the sexual instinct would not hesitate to say so. But there have been almost no examinations of the mental condition of more than a few necrophiles. 
it is laughable to suggest there is anywhere close to sufficient evidence to make a scientific link between necrophilia and psychological derangement. I do not understand. What are you saying? The field of psychiatry is unequipped at this juncture to make a judgment on whether necrophiles are mentally unsound. This is to my great chagrin and something I intend to rectify. Does the prosecution rest? Does the defense have any remaining questions? I'm quite happy with things as they stand. In that case, uh, Richard, you are excused. Uh, thank you. Anytime, Christoph. The wife says hello. End scene. Carl and his papa on stage. Papa sits reading a letter. Carl paces. Projection. A home in Ulrich, Kingdom of Hanover. This word? A new coinage of his means um, sexual love of children. Oh. Yes. Well. This is exciting. Exciting? Is it not? No. Oh. It is no less than an insult. I think that may be a little far. He wants to systemically classify people of my nature as pathological. You know how sometimes I need you to put things in terms I can understand? Yes. This is one of those times. So essentially what he wants to do is make a guide for medical, legal, and political professionals, right? Right. And in this book, he would be outlining all the different types of diseased, dangerous people that exist. So a person who performs um, sexual acts on animals. There are people who do that? Yes. For the love of. And he would say, oh, people who do that are practicing bestiality. And then he would talk about all the cases he has encountered. Cases? People who have done that, that he has heard of through his practice as a psychologist or in the court of law or through his research. How would he research that? So he would say about people like me, oh, they are such and such term. And this is the crackpot medical justification I have for why these people should be thrown in jail. Then do not answer his letter. Well. What? He is quite successful. Everyone in the legal profession knows him. I followed everything he wrote before um, getting debarred. Right. So if he is going to write about people like me, no matter what, maybe I can at least try to steer him in the right direction. Then write him back. But then if I do help him, I may go down as the person who sold out his kind. Then do not write him. But the exposure could be quite valuable, and the man is brilliant. Then write him. What do you want me to say? What would you do? Well, you have such a wonderful mind. Thank you. And he would not be the first person whose mind you changed. I never thought I would get you on my side, after all. A parent can never abandon their child. Or mama, for that matter. Right. A heavy silence. Carl hugs his father. They break. Well, should I give it a try then? I think you would regret not trying. And if I were one of your kind. Yes. I would be grateful you tried to help. Okay. Dear Dr. Kraft Abing. I must say, your letter comes as a bit of a surprise. I confess that I am reluctant to accept your offer. You see, to people of your disposition, people like me are diseased. I cannot agree. It is natural for me to feel looking at a beautiful young man as you do looking at a beautiful young woman. It disturbs me that you plan to include my experiences amongst those who sexually exploit young children and animals. Dear Mr. Ulrichs, 
Thank you for your letter. I apologize for causing you offense. Perhaps an explanation is due. This work you see is a medico forensic text. As I'm sure you can appreciate, I must present my findings in a way that satisfies the moral, the moral standards, standards of, the of the court. Of course. I was a legal professional myself. I was debarred for perhaps you can derive. Uh, yes. I followed your work quite closely. Your arguments always impressed me. I appreciate your compliment. And I must say, I am quite impressed by your bravery going before the Congress of German jurists. They can be rather forceful. I did not notice. And I have been impressed with your writings thus far. Oh, what have you acquired? I will go ahead and send you my complete works and current drafts of- uh, I, That will not be necessary. Let us avoid the um, outside eyes. You live in Prussia, yes? Hanover. Oh. Shall you be annexed, do you think? That cannot and will not happen here. Hmm. I was interested in your coinages. Bestiality, pedophile. What will you call my people? Uh, it, it is still so early in the research. Perhaps we can return to this question later when... I know my a... way around the classical languages, as I am sure you have gathered. I was thankful you could read my Latin. I, I had worried about the... Censors, of course. Richard, what do you make of people like me? How will you treat us? It's distressing how rare it is these days to find people adept in the classical languages. For what it is worth, the book will include a vast range of pathologies. I am not sure I like that word. I have a young male patient who is sexually aroused by velvet. His story will be included. That is a pathology to you? Well, all right. I will contact every person I believe could be of assistance to you, though, as I am sure you can understand, Many will be reluctant to share their stories, even anonymously. I understand. Thank you. I will be in touch. Write me any time. Yours, Karl Heinrich Ulrichs. Regards, Richard von Kraft Abing. End scene. Lena's home. Lena sits across from Josiah. They are having a courting appointment. Projection, Lena's home in Vienna. I like your outfit. Thanks. I uh, heard you can read English, is that true? Yes. That's really impressive. Thanks. How do you know English? There was an older girl who taught me before her family went to America. Oh, do you miss her? I don't really want to talk about it. Okay. So what do you like to read? In English? Sure. Novels, mainly. Jane Eyre, Aurora Lee, Sense and Sensibility. Do you know any of those? No, but that's not saying much. I'm stuck reading good old Moses and the Prophets most of the time. <laughs> Alas! He got a laugh. <laughs> Sorry. Don't draw attention to it. Got it. Why do you like those books? Well, um... Aurora Lee. Let's do that one. Well, I really relate to the main character. She's really bookish, and everyone's always telling her what she can and can't do because she's a woman, but she ignores them. And then there's this guy who's nice but really pompous and she just has all of these really smart things to say and sorry people don't usually ask me why i like things i apologize sounds good do you know any other languages i'm teaching myself latin planning on going catholic oh no judaism is bad enough and what is that supposed to mean lena <laughs> sorry papa I'm on your side. That doesn't offend you? No, 
I'm going to be the world's worst rabbi. You'll be great. Don't say that. It's true. Well, do you not want to be a rabbi? I guess I do. It's always been expected of me. I'll be really good at Hebrew, at least. I'll teach you some Latin. You teach me some Hebrew. Deal. Lay on scene. Wow, you might be better than me now. Are you okay? Oh, yes. It's nothing. Uh, tell me more about rabbinical school. And scene. Carl and Richard on stage. Dear Dr. Kraft Abing, I hope your research is going smoothly. Expect forthcoming messages from an Erningen in Passau and a Zwitter in Heiligen Hafen, who have agreed to help you in your research. It strikes me, and I believe given you your special attention to language, you will agree, that it is essential for us to discuss some possible coinages for those you and I are speaking of. Throughout the following, projections show a growing word web attempting to keep up with everything with Richard taking notes as best he can all the while. You are of course familiar with Erning, a biological male with a female psyche who is attracted to men. Erningin is similar, a biological female with a male psyche who is attracted to women. Then there are Dianings and Dianingins, respectively, masculine men who are attracted to women and feminine women who are attracted to men. Combine the two terms, and you have Uranodionings and Uranodioningans. The first, men who are attracted to both men and women. The second, women who are attracted to both women and men. Zwitters are those who have organs endemic to the two most frequently occurring biological sexes. More bluntly, having both male and female genitalia. And there are further subdivisions I've coined for when we approach this conversation in greater depth. Homosexual person attracted to people of the same sex. Heterosexual, person attracted to people of the opposite sex. I eagerly await your thoughts on this strange task of definitions we approach. Hoping all is well in Vienna, Karl Heinrich Ulrichs. Lights dim on them, Poplar unseen. Keep alert of this fellow. He is a person of immense intelligence and drive, but his ability concerns me. He holds grudges when he perceives he has been wronged. His trust is a delicate thing, but when he believes in another's intentions, his loyalty is remarkable. End scene. Lena's home. Lena is sitting in the area with Josiah. Lena's mother, father, Uncle Otto, and Aunt Clara play cards in the kitchen, just adjacent to the sitting area. It is not. Hear me out. To be a girl is to be free. Not even close. To wear dresses, to live the idyllic family life. To squeeze into corsets, to push out babies. Be appropriate, Lena. Sorry. To love. To love? Unrestrained. Towards family, of course. Without the expectation of distance imposed by manhood. Oh. I'm afraid I should be going. So soon. Oh, do stay. I, I really must. Uh, some more strudel, eh? Uh, why are you so soon when... Uh, My you... parents are probably worried. Oh, nonsense. It's so early. You can stay a little. Oh, enough. Leave the boy alone. It was so lovely to see you again, Josiah. Thank you, Mrs. Metzger. Always such a pleasure to have you, Josiah. It, it's mine, really. So polite, this one. Oh, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Metzger. Uh, call me Isaac, please. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, I'll, um... See you soon? Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much for your hospitality. Oh, you're oh, welcome sorry. anytime. Well, my home is as good as yours. Shalom, kid. <laughs> Do you hear what he said? Love. Oh, do not curse it, Isaac, but oh, this is so wonderful. He seems good, but can we just calm down? He seems. He's a real mensch, I tell you. 
He is the answer to our prayers. Let us not get ahead of ourselves now. I think a rabbi in the family. Not very manly, though. Eh? Bit of an odd sort. How do you mean? Not to ruffle any feathers. He is a good kid, all right? It is nothing, Isaac. No, no. You say he is not manly, but you say he is good. Which is he? He is a good match for Lena. That is all. A good match for Lena. Isaac, please. No, you come into my house, you insult my future son-in-law. Papa. I want to know. What do you mean, not manly? He is the one who said he wanted to be a girl. He did not say that. It was something like that. What? He has a, he's a sensitive sort, loves family. That is nice. I did not say he was not nice. You said he was not manly. Who cares? Is that so bad? See, good match. They are both a little odd. You are calling my daughter odd. We should go now. Oh, uh, uh, good night then, everyone. Good night, Clara, Otto. Good night, Aunt Clara. Good night, Uncle Otto. Good night, Lena. Isaac? Uncle Otto extends his hand to Isaac. Isaac is uninterested, but his wife nudges him. He shakes his hand. Good night now. No offense meant. Good night. Aunt Clara and Uncle Otto exit. For a time, Clara can be heard yelling at Otto in Yiddish. Otto attempts to calm her down. The nerve of that man. It is okay, Isaac. Okay? Who does he think he is? Coming into my house and being insulting? It's okay, Papa. It's not, Lena. It is my duty to stand up for you. I know Chisai is a softer sort, but when you marry, you must ensure he does the same. If they marry. Right. Of course. No use staying up stewing. I'm going to bed. Father goes to Lena and hugs them. They kiss him on the cheek. Good night, little one. Good night, Papa. I will be in soon. Very well, very well. That was interesting. Yes. I like him. You do? Yes. Oh, Lena, that is wonderful. He has a kind heart. He does. Do not listen to what your uncle says. Well, he's not wrong. There is something soft to him. Is that bad? No, not at all. Good. Mother kisses Lena on the top of their head. Good night, dear. Do not stay up reading too late. Good night, Mama. Lay on scene. Were there any words that confused you this week? No? End scene. Richard on stage. Dear Mr. Ulrichs, thank you for your letter. The terminology question is, of course, key to me, and I very much appreciate your uh, colorful contributions. Given my scientific focus, the classical language are proving key to me as well. I believe, however, that some simplifying, shall we say, is warranted. I've received a helpful suggestion from one of the people you have generously put me in contact with. Kurt Benny, I believe, was his name. He used the terms heterosexual and homosexual for attraction to the opposite sex and attraction to the same sex, respectively. I rather like the practicality of these terms. More to the point, perhaps? It is always a privilege to hear your developed perspective. Regards, Richard Von Kraft Abe. End scene. Papa and Carl mid-conversation in Papa's home. Projection, Ulrich, Kingdom of Hanover. And when were you going to tell me? I am not sure. When it was ready, perhaps. It looks ready to me. You cannot do this. I have to. Carl, please. I have a responsibility to others like me. It is my duty you to You have do a this. responsibility to yourself first. You're asking to be stoned if you publish this. I am asking for nothing but justice. You are not thinking right. If you could talk these things out, then maybe... I talk about them all the time. You just never listen. I do. I try. I have to publish this. Carl, you do not understand what, would, what will happen. The Prussians will take all of the issues away. 
and then they will arrest you. I have to do then, something. Yes, something, but not this. These are not your countrymen. I know that. These are not civilized people. They will do things to you in prison that you cannot take. I have confidence in my strength. Carl, you must understand. When they imprison you, they will not let you have contact with the people you write to. They need you. You cannot just... I cannot save them through that. In delaying real action, I have damned many already. Believe me, Papa. I have tried and tried and tried, but so many saw no hope before. Now that their love is truly officially illegal, I have lost correspondence from Magdeburg, Frankfurt, and mines already to suicide. More will die at the hands of murderers emboldened by the Prussians' hate. I cannot save my kind on my own when the laws of an empire stand against me. Bold action must be taken. Carl, I just think there is something not right in your head. I know you cannot see it now, but if you could just step back and separate this one thing from... I have an obligation to take action. But if that action is hopeless, then you have an obligation to yourself. It is done. The issues are sent to Berlin and will come out in two weeks. You have, dis you have distributors? Only a couple stands, but yes. They cannot credit you as Numa Numantius? That name is over. It ended at the Congress of German Jurists. You had to understand that. Those were lawyers. Those were civilized people. They are anything but civilized. You are, you are exposing yourself to all possible harm. Why? You have to know by now. I just cannot understand. Papa. I need to be alone. Papa, come back. Projection, a magazine cover. Prometheus, issue one, February 1868. A new journal on man-manly relations. Published by Carl Heinrich Ulrichs of Hanover. May she be freed again. Projection, Prometheus, issue two. Then... After a delay, canceled. Poplar, unseen. Regarding my former assistant, all I have left to say is that I am deeply disappointed in the way things have unfolded. End scene. Lena's home. Another meeting with Josiah. Aunt Clara is in the kitchen keeping herself occupied. Projection, Vienna. Latin lesson number one. Declensions. Declensions change the endings of words to indicate their relations to surrounding words. Like German, Latin uses declensions. So by looking at word form, you can tell if a word is singular or plural, the subject or the direct object, male, female, neutral. With me so far? Projection. The words male, female, and neutral stacked on top of one another. I think so. So a noun can fall under five possible declensions in Latin. We're starting with the first one. All five declension charts in super small print project. When do we start learning words? We'll learn a few as we're declining, but we'll focus on declensions first, mostly because that's how I learned. Okay. Projection zooms in on first declension chart. So the first declension only has feminine words, which luckily for you means you only have to memorize one set of endings to start with. Other declension paradigms in Latin tend to have at least two genders of words, meaning you have to learn different sets of endings for each gender. Oh, just overhearing this makes my head ache. Sorry, not Clara. Projection. Genders of words detem determine their endings in Latin. And how do you know a word is first declension to begin with? Familiarity with the language. Which we're learning now. Yes. Oh, and there are a few masculine words that fall under the first declension, like poet. Projection, photo of Walt Whitman. And sailor. Projection, erotic photo of gay sailors, old-timey and black and white. But 
their decline the same as the other feminine words in the declension. Isn't that interesting? I love you, Lena, but you sure find some strange things interesting. A knock on the door, quickly followed by Uncle Otto letting himself. Clara, I need you at the shop now. Yeah, just barge in, eh? That Kessler woman came in and insisted that you come right away to help her. She was not supposed to be in until tomorrow. You tried telling her that. Can you not take care of it? She wants you. You know how she gossips when she does not get her way? Well, what about these two? Isaac is coming to look after them. How long will they be left alone? Ah, who knows? (laughs) My, if I did not think they were such good kids. Now, you two can behave yourselves, correct? Yes, Aunt Clara. Josiah? Yes, ma'am. All right, now, remember, Lena, your father is coming, so, but you will be alone for a while. Yes, Aunt Clara. Alone. I understand. For a while. Clara. And now, you'll excuse me, duty calls. Your family is, um, interesting. That's one way to put it. Are they very traditional? It is complicated. Ah, uh, should we, uh, learn some more Latin? Josiah, do you want to kiss me? Uh Uh-huh. I want to know what it is like. Your father could be here any moment. We do not have to do anything else. Just that. Please. I I don't know if that's a good idea. Oh. I just think it would be better to wait. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not like that, I swear. I'd never think that. You're one of the kindest. It, do you like me? I... Oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I... It's okay. Scheiße. Beat. Josiah kisses Lena. They break. Lena? Lena, are you all right? Please say something. Maybe we can learn some Latin? Hello, Josiah. Uh, well, hello, sir. Uh, nothing funny before I got here? Oh, no, no, no. I should go. Uh, you will stay for dinner, of course. I'm afraid not. I really must see Rabbi Momod. Oh? Uh, I have to talk to him about some business. Ah, uh, excellent. Nothing exciting, I assure you. Uh, uh, no, uh, of course not. <laughs> I, uh, goodbye, sir. Uh, Goodbye, my son. Goodbye, Lena. Nice boy, huh? Leaves you speechless, flustered. That is good. That is love. Young Lena and Lay on scene. What was that? What are you talking about? End scene. Projection. Congress of German Jurists, Munich, 1867. An undercurrent of chattering amongst a crowd, a crowd made up of middle-aged and old men, distinguished members of the Congress of German Jurists, gathered for a conference. A stage with a podium before them. Just removed from the crowd in the backstage, there is Karl, who has just begun to enter his middle age. His heart races. A beat. He makes his decision. Carl takes the podium. Good evening. My name is Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, and I am a former legal advisor for the District Court of Hildesheim in the Kingdom of Hanover. I come before you to propose a revision to the current penal law. This change will damn a continuing flood of suicides taking persons of a certain group. I am one of them. I am an earning, and I am sexually attracted to men. I wish to appeal to your cold, naked intellect with cold, Stop. naked, subtle. Loud expressions of outrage come from the crowd. 
If you wish, I will surrender the floor. Some scattered but audible pleas to let the speaker continue come from the crowd, begrudging silence. I speak for a class of persons who endure legal persecution only because of their sexual nature, which is opposite of what is usual and which nature has planted in them. The crowd erupts, pandemonium, insults are shouted. Crucify soon becomes the dominant cry of the crowd. Carl quickly leaves the podium, blackout, and scene. Lights up, Richard alone on stage. Dear Mr. Ulrichs, I thought you might like to know great progress has been made since we were last in contact. It seems to me now that inverted sexuality occurs as often in women as in men. Strangely, I have seen multiple cases now in which these women had normal childhoods and did not fully awaken to their homosexual desires until puberty. I did not receive a response to my last letter from you. Perhaps with the Prussians taking interest in Hanover, you have decided to err on the side of caution. Or perhaps I caused you offense. My apologies if this is the case. Regards, Richard von Kraft Abing. Lena's home. Lena's mother sits knitting. Lena is reading Aurora Lee. Lena's father enters. Projection, Vienna, 1868. Hi, Papa. Hello, Isaac. What's wrong? Uh, uh, go to your room, please. Papa, what is it? Please. Desire has gone missing. What? He left the synagogue after his studies with Rabbi Mahmoud, and no one has seen him since. I closed the deli early to look for him with the others, but there's not a trace of him anywhere. His parents suspect that he's gone for good. He has got to be somewhere. We've looked everywhere. Everywhere? Mm -hmm. How can you have looked everywhere? Louise, please. We have to go. We have to find him. Louise, just... Think what Lena... He's gone? Is he really... Yes, Lena, but we will find him. Do you really think? I know we will. Dear Mr. Ulrichs, thinking of you now that Hanover has been incorporated into the Prussian Empire, a crackdown to me seems eminent. Exercise discretion. Regards, Richard Von Kraft Abing. How did it go? The police always make me nervous. Uh, still, the Austrian ones are far superior to the Germans. You think they will help? We will see. I had so little to give them, I do not see how I could have been of any help. They did ask me if Josiah had shown any signs of had behaved in any way abnormally or seemed somehow different from usual in the days leading to his disappearance. Uh, Lena, did you notice anything of the sort? It, it could help them. No, nothing. Dear Carl, I hear you have been released from prison. It has been so long since I have last had word from you. How are you? If you would no longer like to stay in touch, I understand, but please, if you are well, let me know so I may be at ease. Yours, Richard. Lena's mother, father, aunt, and uncle play cards in the kitchen area. So it is done? There's been no trace of them, uh, so they're ending their search. The case is still open, but unless new evidence comes in, they will not actively investigate. Not that they put in much of a search in the first place. There's only so much they can do in these cases. <laughs> what is it, Clara? Nothing. So you will have Lena see other boys? Not now. Eventually. She needs time. I agree, but at some point we will have to move forward. Goyim will be goyim and pigs will be pigs. I do not much like that word, Clara. Open run, tell the emperor. You, 
very well. And so's our people's greatest friend. So oh, our people. That is rich coming from you. You would forsake your own before saying a bad word about the police. They are doing their job. You are German. You do not know this country like I do. I know plenty, and I refuse to love a nation that sees us as a lesser race. Clara, be quiet. Lena can hear you. Let her hear it. Let her hear what they think of us. When the Goyim look at us, whether in Germany or Austria. Maybe if people like you did not feel the need to shove it in their faces, they would leave us alone. I see. Maybe if Josiah had looked less Jewish, he would still be with us. Well, I can tell you this. Unless we are dead, we are too Jewish for them. A knock on the door is Rabbi Malmud. Good evening. Rabbi, it is good to see you. Is this a bad time? No, a man like you is always welcome here. I apologize for intruding. I merely wanted to give Lena this sidir. I thought it may offer her some relief during this difficult time. He produces a prayer book. That is very kind. Thank you. Lena. The rabbi has a gift for you. Perhaps this will be of some comfort. Thank you. Lena takes the book. They open it. A note falls out. Oh, uh, that is for you. Some words of counsel. Perhaps best read alone. Go on then. Okay. Lena goes to their room. Lena reads the note. And same. Carl, alone on stage. Dear Richard, it has been a while, has it not? Things have gotten bad. I have been staying with my father since my release from prison. I would not like to talk about what happened there. I hope you understand. My books are banned now. Confiscations seem imminent. I worry about what is to come for my readers. My troubles are far from over. I worry for my father. But there is no turning back now. Keep alert. The cruel specter may yet descend upon Austria. Yours, Carl. And same. Lena stands on a corner of a seedy part of Vienna. They look nervously about. Marlena enters. You lost, dear. Oh, no. Just waiting for someone. Would you like some company until they come? Yes, please. Marlena stands with them. Marlena lights a cigarette. I never imagined I'd be here. People like us never do. People like us? People, in general. Oh. Are you sure you have the right place? I got this note. Lena gives it to Marlena. She reads it. Oh. What? You have the right place, all right. Are you a man? It's just, you look kind of... Excuse me, I need to go. No, wait. Lena? Is that you? Marlena, what are you doing here? This young person was standing here, seemed nervous, so I have been keeping them company. I didn't realize she would be so early. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize the place you wrote, so I thought I'd leave early to find it. I didn't know I'd get here so quickly. Josiah, what are you doing here? I should go. Be kind to them. Do you know that person? She's a friend. She? I, I'm surprised you came. Why did you leave? I had no choice. There's nothing there for me anymore. What about me? Why do you think I wrote to you? I can't run away, Josiah. I can't leave my family. You thought I wanted to elope? I, I don't feel that way. I, I can't feel that way. Oh. You must understand that. I'm sorry the kiss was no good. 
I can do better next time. That isn't the issue. That kind of stuff is hard for me, but I can do better. Lena, I don't want that. I don't think you do either. Your friend, are there others like her? Yes, but they don't do what she does. She's going to get herself killed. Is there a way to be like her and be happy without doing that? For her? No. I thought maybe we could have helped each other. Neither of us would have been happy. I'm not happy anyways. Then come with me. We can help each other in a different way. I can't leave my parents. I'm sorry. You think they'd love you if they knew? I have to hope so. I had thought mine would too, but I was wrong. I hope it's different for you. Will you leave Vienna then? I think I have to. Where will you go? I don't know. I'm glad I met you. Maybe it would have been better if we never met. It could have made it easier to pretend. I will never do that more than I have to ever again. I hope one day you'll get there too. Josiah hugs them. He produces a book. I wanted to give you something before I go. Josiah, no, I can't have people keep giving me books and then leaving. Just take this one. Trust me. The book's cover is projected. Vindex and Inclusa, Numa, Numantius, Blackout, and Scene. In the blackout, the moments after Carl left the stage at the Congress of German Jurists, the crowd yelling, crucify. Enough. The speech was approved in advance, and it will be delivered in its entirety. Some support from the crowd, but mostly boos. Nevertheless, for the sake of modesty, I request the speaker to use Latin in continuing. Does the speaker agree? Carl has left. The speaker has yielded the stand. Would another man care to continue the speech in Latin? No? Then I will. I ask the secretary for the speech as it was submitted to us in writing. Lights up. Carl outside the assembly hall, alone. Beat. Just as he is about to leave, the source of the voice from the first scene enters. He is Carl's former boss, Poplar. Projection. Congress of German Jurists, 1867. Ulrichs. Mr. Hopler. Before one leaves a party, he really ought to say hello to the one who got him in the door. Your dismissal was not my doing, you know. You said nothing in my defense. You think anything I could have said would have helped you? Perhaps not, but you stand guilty all the same. You were and are the greatest of my disappointments, Ulrichs. Few students surpassed your intelligence and your idealism is unmatched. It pained me to realize that the latter was a detriment. How did you get here? There are some sympathetic to my kind in your ranks. No, how did you get here? Some fellow earnings paid my way. They rarely open their wallets, but they seem to think this moment could be momentous for our kind. I would say it was. It was reaction worthy of the old Nazarene. You know he died in the end, yes? But he was brought back. Never proven. Why does he appeal to you so? He died penniless, and his followers failed to understand his wisdom. Is that the legacy you want? You have never understood me or my values. I doubt I can convince you now. Poplar reaches for his wallet. Do you take money from benefactors you dislike? I do not want your pity. This is not pity. This is a purchase. Send your works to my office. Same address. Well, will you take the money or not? Carl takes the money. Thank you. Ulrichs. You remember Wilbur, of course. I had thought we were all troubled in some way. 
but it is clear to me now that that was something else. You heard he was convicted, yes? If I believed in your God, I would seek atonement. Just accept his grace. That is all he wants. Stop trying to save me, Ulrichs. Now get out of here. Carl exits, beat a poplar alone. He re-enters the Congress. End Act 1. Act 2. End the blackout. No. Please. I'm begging you. Stop. No. No. Carl? Lights up. Papa holding his panic-stricken child. Projection. Ulrich, now part of Prussia. 1868. One month after Carl's release from prison. Papa. Papa. It was a dream. I am here. I miss Mama. I miss her so much. I know. I need to stay up for a while. Okay. Do you need to be alone? Yes, please. All right. You will call me if you need me? Yes, Papa. Papa hugs Carl. Do not hesitate to call. I will not. Papa exits. Carl goes to his desk. He lights a candle. He pulls out his papers. He sits and thinks. He writes. Dear Richard, they label us infamous. They exclude us from their company. They make criminal investigations of us and inflict criminal punishments on us. They throw us in jail. They rob us of our existence. They force us out of one city after another. They allow us no resting place to recover from the persecutions. They hunt us like wild animals. In truth, it would seem as if everyone were against us. A knock on the door. Carl grabs a weapon. He goes to the door. More knocking. Who is there? Open up already. Uncle Carl, it's me. Wilhelmina. Carl opens the door. Wilhelmina, a 13-year-old girl, enters and throws her arms around Carl. What are you doing here? Is everything all right? Aren't you glad to see me? It's been so long. We need to get you home. Your mother is going What's to- What's that? That is nothing. You shouldn't have that. You could hurt yourself. You need not worry about- Uncle, promise me you won't hurt yourself. I won't. No, look me in the eye. Promise? I promise. Now let us get you home. I'm not going home. Yes, you are. I need to be here. Why? Please- just let me stay here for the night. What has happened to you? I don't want to talk about that now. I cannot help you if you do not tell me. Wilhelmina, please. Okay. We can talk about it tomorrow. Go get some rest. I can't. Why? I'm scared. You can stay up with me. Thank you. Uncle Carl? Yes? Why do I never see you? I see all my other uncles, but I saw you twice when I was little and then never again. Why? I lead a busy life. Legal work takes up a lot of my time. You lost your license four years ago. Yes, but I have been even busier since then fighting for Hanover's independence. I know. I read your books. How? Mom has them, and she's bad at hiding things. Were you caught? Yeah. Are you... I don't know. I keep thinking I like both, so which am I? You are a Urana Dianingen. Huh? You are... You like boys and girls. Okay. Urano... Dianingen. Dio... Nin. Dio Nin... Gin. Dio Nin Gin. Urano Dio Nin Gin. Yes. 
I'm a freak. No. I am. Listen to me. You are not a freak. No matter how much they tell you that, you must remember you are not. You are never, ever to let them convince you of that. You will have to fight that battle in your head, and it will never fully end, but it will get easier and easier. You are exactly who you are supposed to be, and you are loved. You always will be, even after I have passed on. You are a blessing, and I have never felt more proud of someone than I do now. They embrace Longbeat. Can you get that out of there? Huh? Wilhelmina motions to the weapon. Uh, of course. Carl takes the weapon and goes off. Longbeat of Wilhelmina alone. Carl re enters. It is gone. You're better at hiding things than mom. I know a thing or two about hiding. She really cannot hide things, can she? Some things never change. Don't leave me alone. I will not. We can talk all night if need be, or just sit here. Okay. Why do you make your book so boring? And Sam. Lena sits reading Aurora Lee in their bedroom. After a spell, they close their eyes, remembering. Projection. Lena's home. Lay unseen. Were there any words that confused you this week? No? Blue light on Lay, a Jewish woman on the cusp of 18, sitting at a table. Young Lena, who is two days shy of 13, sits in the chair across from her. Young Lena has a copy of Roar Lee. Impressive. You might be better than me now. You're a good teacher. Thank you. I'm really going to miss you. Not as much as I'm going to miss you. Oh, do not cry. Please do not start crying. I'm begging you. I'm trying so hard. I, I promise I am. I, I've never had a best friend. So I guess this is how it works. I guess we just lose people. I'm sorry. Don't get sick on that dumb boat. <laughs> I will do what I can. I have one more for you. Lay gives young Lena a copy of the Scarlet Letter. Something American for once seems appropriate. Thank you. What's this one about? A young woman who is marked as bad and no matter what she does, everyone still hates her. Does it have a happy ending? You will have to find out. Consider it a birthday present. Thank you. Young Lena goes to her. A moment. Young Lena suddenly hugs Lay hard. Lay hugs back. <laughs> You're almost a man now. Huh? Almost 13. Oh, right. Responsible for all the commandments soon, if you were a boy. Yeah. <laughs> Lay takes young Lena's face in her hands. Lay kisses them. A knock on the door, the blue light cuts out rapidly. Lena, can I come in? Can we talk for a minute? Yeah, yeah, sure. How are you? Uh, good. You've been distant lately. A lot on my mind. I understand. I was engaged before your father, you know. His name was Thomas, and he was a Christian. I was 14. My family did not approve, of course. They said if we married, they would have nothing to do with me. I did not care. I loved him, and that was the most important thing. 
Then the revolutions came and he said he had a duty to fight for the future of Germany. I begged him not to go. What impact would one more foot soldier have in the overall scheme of things? His duty was to me, but he did not see it that way. The lives of millions of future Germans mattered more than the life of one person. Even more than me, I asked him, even more than you. The year after he died, I could find no point in going on. My family could not understand. They kept trying to match me off, saying that would solve everything. I did not believe them. But on a whim, I gave your father a chance. He was nothing like Thomas. He was practical. He laughed loudly. He had no interest in things that did not directly affect him. He told me about his plans to come to Austria. He had an uncle there, he said, who could take him into his deli and advance him if he worked hard. The Jews have a home in Vienna, he would say. That was a place to raise a family. When you are young, you think you are the only thing that matters, that you know it all. But the day you were born, I was born too. You will never love anyone as much as your own child, not your parent, not your husband, not anyone or anything. When you were little, you asked me if I would love you no matter what. Do you remember? If I lied, would you still love me? Of course I would. If I stole, yes. Even if I killed, even then. No matter what, I would always be by your side. The day you were born, it all clicked. This is what life is about. This is all that matters. I do not want you to miss out on that. Clara and Otto don't have kids. Aunt Clara is pregnant, Lena. You're going to have a cousin. I cannot force you to do anything you do not want to do, but your father and I have investigated other potential matches. We think you should give them a try. Do you ever think about Thomas? Of course. You will always remember Josiah, dear, but life continues. Give it some thought and then tell your father and me what you want to do. Lena takes out their copy of the Scarlet Letter and looks at it. Blue light comes up on Lay and young Lena near the end of the kiss. The kiss ends. Lay looks into young Lena's eyes. Lay begins to go. Oh, that. What are you talking about? Blue light fades. Lena chucks their copy of the Scarlet Letter under the bed. They pull out another book from under their bed. They're careful to make sure their surroundings are safe. They begin to read. Carl appears. It is a noteworthy fact that earnings often maintain a truly moving and lifelong love for their mothers. However, Mothers can no longer console an adult earning who is lonely and no longer satisfy their need of comfort. For this, they need a masculine comrade. I mean to say, a lover. Lena closes the book, buries her face. As a footnote, there put possibly could be a fourth sex to correspond with the third one, a sex of persons built like females having woman-womanly sexual desire, that is, having the sexual direction of men. Not an earning, but an earning in. Dear Mr. Ulrichs. End scene. Richard's home. A knock at the door. Richard answers. It's Bernhardt. Projection. Richard's home in Vienna. Hello, Richard. Uh, uh, come in, please. Uh, may I offer you a drink? Uh, no, thank you. Some bread. Bread. I have a loaf. I can cut you some. I am not usually offered bread when I visit people's homes. I apologize. I am not used to playing host. Of course. Uh, sorry. Uh, why bread? It is good for meals. The baker is close by, and the restaurants are far too expensive. You spent the last two days surviving on bread and pastries? That would be exaggerating. Have you had a real meal since you left? 
I am sure many poor folks would be happy to have what I've had in the last few days. You are a doctor and a scholar, not a street urchin. Did you not have dined with one of your colleagues' families? I did not want to impose. Would you rather go hungry than risk being impolite? Suppose that is one way to put it. It makes me so angry. Oh, no, it is not her fault. Do not excuse her. It is not right. She had her reasons. She gives no consideration. She comes to my house, no warning, mind you, and says she is unhappy. Unhappy. Mary Louise, I tell her, you cannot just abandon your husband. That is not done. That is not fair. It is shameful. It has only been a couple days. And you, left here alone, nothing to eat but a, a baker's scraps. She does not think, Richard. She has always been selfish. She has never bothered to consider the impact of her actions. That, that she is have. still my wife, and I would ask you not to speak ill of her. Sorry. There it is, the most vile part of it all. You, of all people, he abandons you. Not abandon. Do not say that. She will come back. Will she not? Of course she will. She is not without morals. Oh, good. I have been... I have been so adrift without her. I, I will be better, Burn. I promise. I'm not sure such a thing is possible. Will she be back tomorrow, then? Perhaps not that soon. Oh. But she is returning soon, yes? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Then when will she be able soon, to? I promise. But you have to help me. You see, she has a condition for coming back. It's nonsense, I know, but she is obstinate. And that is? She said I need to be able to look her in the eye and say I am comfortable with your research. That is all? Yes, I, I do not understand. Uh, she has always enjoyed hearing your sort of tales. She claims there is something different about the way you talk about some set of perverts now. Uh, the name of them escapes me. What do you need from me? Just tell me about your research. So if she presses me, I will have some sort of idea of what I am talking about. But you do not have to worry, Richard. I will not judge. Nothing disturbs me anymore. Well, I am preparing the book of sexual pathologies. Ah, yes, uh, honorable project. It will be of much use to us in the courtrooms. Yes, though not all of the cases described will warrant prosecution. Very well. And I have included some new terminology and categories, sadism, masochism, uh, yes, you have always enjoyed coining new words. Uh, uh, no, that, that is enough. You are still you, she is still she. Is there a specific pathology she does not enjoy hearing about? I believe so. Then do not talk to her about that. She will be home soon. Look, I am terribly sorry about all of this. She embarrasses me sometimes, but uh, she is my sister. I will make this right, Bird. I promise. I'm sure you will. Oh, uh, may I talk with you about a case before I go? Certainly. Uh, it is an unusual one. Uh, quite disturbing, uh, really. A man solicited the services of a young prostitute, and after the fact, the prostitute blackmailed him. And now the John acquiesced for a while, but eventually he got fed up and said enough is enough. In short, uh, they are both in custody. Nothing atypical there. It seems you will have an easy case. Ah, but I have not told you the kicker. The prostitute is a male. And I am representing him. How did he get the money? It is not my business to ask. Now, uh, when they arrested the John, he screamed something rather ridiculous. He yelled that he was, uh, uh, what was that word? Your, your Guinan? Or... And that they could not arrest him, for he was simply practicing his nature. Mm. It's strange, is it not? But here is where it grows most disturbing. I, I had my assistant do some research, and it turns out there is no law against a man having carnal relations with another man. 
I'm very well. Some crimes are so unimaginable. We are incapable of foreseeing them and, and writing the proper laws. But surely justice will be served, yes? And should a, a precedent be established here, we may prevent such acts from continuing. I, I, I know it is unlikely, but have you come across such an incident before? Many times, yes. My research has been quite focused on that as of lately. Uh, that's excellent to hear. I, I feel pity for the boy. He is a man, technically, but still quite young. A long stint in jail seems unnecessary. Uh, surely he must have learned his lesson having had that repulsive behavior done to him. Uh, the John, though, must receive his due punishment. Er, Ginnon or, or not, uh, whatever that may mean. Earning. Uh, pardon? I believe he would have called himself an earning. Yes, uh, that, that sounds right. I've had many long correspondences for research. Oh, that is understandable, uh, though I imagine it is quite upsetting for you. Mm. Uh, so may I count on your expertise uh, to stick up for someone brutalized in such a heinous way? I wonder if you might be going about this case the wrong way. If I take the stand and say what the John did was wrong, would not that mean your client participated in that wrongdoing as well? I do not understand. He did not do anything. The man was the one doing the thing to him. One was the aggressor, the other the victim. Then this would be a rape case. My client prostituted himself. I could never get a rape charge. That is why I need you. You know about people like this John. I want him charged for using a man like he is a woman. I do know people like him, but I also know about people like your client. There are those who want relations in that way. Surely not. He expressed such grief to me. He said once was enough for him. I doubt that very much. Are you saying you will not testify? I am saying that the best tact here would be to play defense. Your client will already face time for prostitution and extortion. It would not be advisable to invent a new charge for him. But he cannot have enjoyed that. Who could? Our, our bodies are not made for that. Get him a plea deal. Clean him up, have him apologize. I can take the stand and talk about how common these things are. He will not have to go away long if he behaves himself in court. Why are you not disturbed? You have a grandson. You are letting someone go who would do horrible things to a young boy. Burn, I know about these people now. If he is an earning, he is only interested in grown men, not young boys. You would allow someone who would take advantage of you then to walk free? But they are no more likely to take advantage of you or me than we are to take advantage of a young woman. Why do you only have two kids? What? Answer me. Pardon, you are being ridiculous. You will answer me. You, you, you cannot believe that I am one of them. You are far too intelligent for that. Do not avoid my question, Richard. You are making me very angry. You do not want any more. No, oh, no, she has always said that she wanted many. Do you not think she was beautiful? Did you not want to touch her? Was she so repulsive to you? Of course. I thought she was beautiful. Then why? I cannot tell you. You will? It is a private matter. That settles it. But, but Burn, do, do not go. Please, I, I, I'm not. How, how, how could you think? You I, will not see her again. Do not come to my house. Do you hear me? Do not. She had a miscarriage. We were so ashamed. I, we, we could not go through that again. Please, Burn, do not take her away. I need her. I cannot live without her. Please. I will ask her. If what you say is true, I will come back. If not, you will stay away. End scene. Lena alone. Dear Mr. Ulrichs, my name is Lena, and I am in Erningen from Vienna. Um. End scene. Morning at the home of Carl's father. Carl's still up. Wilhelmina asleep on the floor. Wilhelmina. 
Wilhelmina, mm? it is morning. You can sleep longer if you want. No, that's okay. What now? Well, I can talk to your parents, though I do not know if that would help your cause. It would. Mom misses you. She does. She does. I can tell. We should talk about staying safe. It is a hard world out there. Wouldn't lesson one be don't tell the whole world? Ouch. Sorry. You are right. Given my experience, I would not advise anyone to do similarly. Though that may be the only way this all changes. Yeah. But the thing I am more concerned about is, should you want to love... Um, I already have, Uncle Carl. Oh, did anyone find out? Was she your own age? Did she make you? No. It was great. That's all I need to know. Oh, another day, another mark, eh? Good morning, Grandpa. Who is that? She looks like trouble. Oh, brother. Get on over here, trouble. Wilhelmina goes and embraces her grandfather. How have you been feeling? Cannot complain. Well, you always can complain, but what good would that do? How about I make us some breakfast? Oh, you do not have to oh, worry. nonsense. Start the day off right. Do you think he heard us talking about... It does not matter. He understands. Oh. How's he been, really? As good as can be hoped. And seen. Lena, alone. You can write about me if anything I say is at all interesting. Just please change my name, please. Um, thank you for... I was wondering if you could help me understand. And seen. Richard's home. He is alone. A knock at the door. He answers. Can I come in? So she told you? Through many tears, but yes. Why did you not tell us? It was too painful. She felt like she had failed. He would have been a boy. I felt it. I talk to him when I do not know what to do. I ask him how he is, if I am doing the right thing. Do I make you proud? Will I see you one day? Sometimes I feel as though my chest fills with his warmth, as if he talks to me. I do not know if it is him. It sounds like me, the calmer, smarter me, but I hold on to it. I want him to be real. At any rate, uh, you assured me that you are not in uh, earning. Uh, your work seems to be making an impression on her. She wonders if one day she will think like you do. And I truly hope she does not. Do not talk to her about that for a while. Let this cool off. What will you say about them? I do not know. I think that their desire is diseased. Well, at least you admit that. But I think maybe it is not so harmful. I do not think we should be prosecuting them. You are going to get a summons soon. Ignore it. I will have it revoked. Burn, please. Do not fight me on this. I do not want you ruining your reputation. What will happen to them? I will clean up my boy, get him a good deal. And the John? 
he will serve time, that is certain. Not as long as he deserves, but I do not imagine the other inmates will take kindly to him. So there is that. That is wrong. I do not know if I trust your judgment on right or wrong anymore. If you talk to these people like I have. Yes. May, you may very well struggle like I do. I should help get her ready. And you could use a real meal. Thank you for bringing her home again. Richard, if you are right, that these people are not what common knowledge says they are, you had better be absolutely certain. Because if you are not unimpeachable in your evidence, well, Dear Carl, I hope you are well. The question of people like you has weighed heavily on my mind as of late. Perhaps I can be helping people like you in a discreet way. If you know any of any of your kind near Vienna and they are interested in receiving counsel, please direct them to me. Let them know. <laughs> Tell them not to worry about payments. That is no object. Only the discreetness is the thing. Yours, Richard. Well, Richard, if you are serious about your offer, I have one you really ought to see. End scene. Lena on stage. Dear Mr. Ulrichs, my name is Lena, and I am an Erningen from Vienna. And you can write about me if anything I say is at all interesting. Just please change my name, please. Um, I know people probably write you all the time and say how much you mean to them, but you have helped me more than you can know. I want you to know that what you do means so much, and though they're not exactly fun, your books mean more to me than anything I've ever read. I would not know there are people like me out there if it was not for you. Thank you. I'm Jewish and an only child. I've been alone my whole life. Didn't really have friends as a child, not anything meaningful. I couldn't relate to any of the girls. When I was 12, I met this woman and she was so beautiful and kind and she gave me books. And then I'm about to turn 13 and she's leaving and she says, you're almost a man now. What did she mean? Did she know? Because after that, she kisses me. And then she left. And since then, I've just been trying to understand. I don't... Is that how this works? And I don't want you to think that's the only reason I feel the way I do. I've always felt like this. But since then, there's been this... I just want to scream at her sometimes. Why? Why did you do that? I found out about you from this boy I knew. He left home. It may not have been his choice. He gave me your book, and I just don't know if it's worth losing my family to be me. Um, my parents want me to get married. They just want me to have someone after they go, because they're all I've got, and they know that, and after them, I'm just by myself. But I can't do it and I can't I just I have to tell them I can't lie to them it's just I'm not like that I want for them to see this is me this I'm going to tell them and then I'll never get to meet my cousin and I won't get to see any of them again and I'll just have to oh gosh um right back please you're amazing yours Lena So I was wondering if you could be of help with that. Ever regret your line of work, Richard? Just wish you had adopted a trade, never went to the city? Not before, but lately perhaps, yes. I've received a lot of letters from people like you, Carl. I do not understand it. How are you folks so hopeful 
so alive. I would like to hear your story. You have led me to many, but I have never heard yours. You have read my work. That is not the same. From you, Carl, I want to hear it from you. Have you always been a homosexual? I have never been a man and I have never been a woman. My body is male, my inside is female. But you are a homosexual. Please, I just need to speak. They always knew I was different, perhaps before I did. My teachers, my schoolmates, my family. My mother would say, it is all right. Someday you will be a man. But I dressed like a girl when I was young and I only played with girls. Even when that ceased, I remained. I created a person named Numa Numantius, who was all, the full being. I kept this person apart from me, but they were always present. Projection, Carl's first writings on people like him, followed by a slide of the book cover from earlier, Vindex and Inclusa by Numa Numantius. When did you first have relations with a man? Um, there was a man who- Breathe. Be here now, be here now, be here now, be here now. I was 13. My writing instructor did things to me I did not understand. It became tied with that. I began to think I was like that. I did not want to be like that, so I kept it in. But then there was Peter. He was kind. He held my hand in the garden, but I would not get close to him. I had fought it so long and I could feel myself giving in, wanting to give in. He touched my cheek and said, if I could make you see yourself for who you truly are, you would never ask why I adore you. And so I loved him. Did anyone find out? No, I would not tell my family until many years later. That was difficult. My mother died last year. I feel a space in me where she used to be. Earnings are close to their mothers, even if they do not accept. She accepted in the end. And then God took her from me. I wondered for so long if he hates us, if that is why he gave us a nature that cannot yield children. But I know now that he does. He loves us and he longs for our freedom. But every day that passes, another person like me dies because they think God hates them. Because people like you think God hates us. But I know he does not. It's wrong, Richard. You know it is. People with knowledge must make it known. Richard, you must tell them. Protectors of justice should not shun knowledge, but rather they should conform to it. Yes, laws and rights must comply with the results of research. Remember, you once said the judicial murders, the witch hunt trials, the persecutions are over, but you know now they are not. Let us celebrate the present, blessed by the spirit of humanity, dedicated to correcting the past mistakes. We do not belong in your book. Write about Grounded us in alone. in research which seeks to establish the laws of human thoughts, desires, and emotions. You could be the leader, the first of your kind to fight states beside us, turns, a name to be remembered gained, forever. A standard for the evaluation of human behavior. Well, what do you say? Dear Richard, I am gladdened by your latest article 
in which you rightly say that the present must be dedicated to correcting past mistakes. I am encouraged too by our correspondence of late. I feel you are now truly beginning to understand us. Surely this all means you will be endorsing our cause soon. I look forward to your next article. Please remember, every day you linger, another person like me dies, and a million more suffer. Yours, Carl. Projection, four months later. Dear Richard, I am surprised to see that you have still made no statement on behalf of Earnings and all those who are not Dianings or Dianingans. It is my hope that you are saving such a statement for your book. Please do not hesitate to contact me at any point in these final stages. I would be happy to provide any final clarifications. Yours, Carl. Projection, two months later, then a book cover, Psychopathia Sexualis by Dr. Richard Von Kraft Abing. Dear Dr. Kraft Abing, I have read your book. You have somehow managed to both denigrate my kind and steal from my perspective an impressive feat. When we corresponded, you covered up your disdain so well. I see now that when I talk to you of love, you heard nothing but disease. It may interest you to know that disease is consuming my life. You probably think this is a punishment from God. My doctor begs me to stop working toward the cause, but I will not. You have given me even more reason to fight. Signed, Karl Heinrich Ulrichs. Projection, 14 years later. Dear Richard, you respond to these letters now and again, so it may be said you are one of my few friends. It is customary for friends to tell one another when they have experienced a loss, as you have done over these last few years. I thought I would tell you then that I have laid my father to rest. I thank God he lasted as long as he did. He has been my light through these dark years of struggle. My health has taken a turn for the worse in these difficult times. My doctor believes only warm weather can save me now. I told him I am out of money and that begging my way to Italy would surely kill me. He says that it is worth the risk, that I have no chance of surviving the coming winter here. So I am off. No money, no father. If I make it there alive, I will write to you with my new address. If not, please, Richard, you are the last hope for my cause. I cannot bear to think the movement dies with me. Yours, Carl. To Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, L'Aquila, Italy, September 21st, 1894. Projection, a book cover. Psychopathia Sexualis, 1894, Revised Edition, by Dr. Richard Vaughn Kraft Abing. A note is attached, but only one thing is written on it, a page number. I breathe in, and I flip to it. In conclusion, homosexuality is a sick, mostly hereditary, degenerative condition. The usual fare. Read on. Homosexuality cannot be said to be a sign of pathology. The primary cause of homosexuality seems to be biological, with its beginnings in the womb. The prosecution of biological differentiations is unwise, as such differentiations come about through no fault of one's own. Moreover, the actions of homosexuals between each other, when practiced with respect for the other party, seem rarely to cause harm. Therefore, the prosecution of homosexual acts is unadvisable. Born this way, that was my idea. My name is nowhere in the book. Still, I suspect these words will ring out for our advancement more than anything under my name. A few months later, Richard passes on, but he sends one last thing, his defense of my kind 
this time in a journal written not in Latin, but in German. I read the issue cover to cover. It is an impressive effort centered wholly on my kind, edited by someone named Magnus Hirschfeld. Projection, image of Magnus Hirschfeld's face with the following underneath. Magnus Hirschfeld, German Jewish scientist and activist, 14 May, 1868 to 14 May, 1935. He has started an institute to advocate for gender and sexual minorities, the first of its kind. I can feel it. He will far eclipse Richard and improve upon my efforts in every way. A peace comes over me. Projection, Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, 1825 to 1895. Exile and Popper. Wilhelmina enters, Carl remains on stage. When he dies, Magnus gives us money to go to the funeral. He says he owes his life to Carl. A lot of us do, I say. I bring my husband and our kids. Our marriage is good. He's like me, a Uranodionin, though he prefers the term bisexual. I worry we will be the only ones at the funeral, but then half the town shows up. There are workers, students from the university, officials. I've never seen anything like it. A man in black enters. You are his niece, of course. Yes. That fire of his burns in your eyes. He spoke of you often. Kids, I want you to meet someone really special. Oh, uh... I want them to know. Your aunt and I loved each other very much. He spent his life fighting so that we could all love each other for who we are. You may never have met him, but know that no matter where you go, his love will always be with you. The man approaches Carl. He looks into Carl's eyes. They kiss. They have a last moment together. The man exits. Lights fade on all except a spot on Carl. It finally comes to me. Pride. I am proud to have dealt the initial blow to have lived as I did. Projection, a historical image of Carl Ulrichs, fades into black screen, blackout. The theater illuminates in a flood of images of queer persons living and dead. Queer persons across a wide span of ages, complexions, ethnicities, nationalities, abilities, gender identities, sexes, orientations, and all those other census signifiers from all corners of the globe. These slowly fade, and the sound of someone singing a lullaby is heard. The lights come up dimly on the singing person, Lena, who is holding their baby cousin in their arms. Sleep, cousin. I know not yet what you will be, but no matter what, I will love you as you are. <laughs>